Our study in John tonight is going to straddle two chapters. Uh, we've already gotten through much of chapter 12, and so we will uh, finish chapter 12, and I believe we'll get into the beginning of chapter 13. I'm not 100% sure about that, but I think it likely. Chapter 12 began a week approximately a week before Jesus was to be crucified, six days before the Passover. And it began with the anointing of Jesus by Mary in the home of Mary and Martha and, uh, as Mark tells us, in the home of Simon the leper, whoever he might have been. And uh, all four of the Gospels, or I take it back, I think three of the Gospels, uh, cover this story. And that is a story that seems to indicate that Mary had perception, spiritual perception that exceeded that of even the disciples, which isn't too surprising because we are basically told that they were rather dull. I mean, that's, uh, they tell us that themselves as they write their own stories. Um, they admit that they were dull. And Mary was perceptive. She sat and listened to Jesus at his feet when others were distracted with other things and she apparently knew that Jesus was going to die and she came and brought some costly perfume and poured it over his feet John tells us but Mark tells us it was over his head also uh, anointing his head and his feet now the anointing of the feet would be just an, uh, an elaborate variation on the normal hospitality of washing a guest's feet with water. To do so with perfume would be, of course, uh, to show great honor on a guest, especially with such expensive perfume that was worth about a year's wages for an average laborer. Um, but to anoint the head had connotations probably of anointing a king. Not that Mary would be the one who would be in the position to anoint a king, but the oil poured over the head was what was done when David was anointed and of course when Saul was anointed the early kings of Israel were anointed with oil and here Jesus is anointed with perfume and when she is criticized for this apparent waste Jesus defends her action and says she has done it anointing him in advance for his burial uh, you usually don't anoint a dead body until it's uh, dead it's part of the embalming or preserving or, um, what should we say, honoring process that you do to a body after it's dead. However, Jesus, when he died, was hastily buried and was not able to be given a full, uh, proper treatment. His body uh, was taken off the cross as sundown was coming on the, the night before Sabbath or the afternoon before Sabbath, and therefore they wanted to get the body buried and be done with that before the Sabbath came. And they hastily buried it, but the women came back Sunday morning with spices and such, which they hoped they could use to give his body more of a proper anointing and, and treatment as they would ordinarily to honor a dead body because it had not been properly done apparently on the day that he was buried. Jesus, however, had been properly anointed beforehand by Mary. And whether she really understood that or not, we don't know, but we, we can assume that she did. Jesus said she did it for this purpose. Now, whether that was the hidden purpose that she herself did not even perceive or the purpose that she intended, we can't be sure. But I think the latter is the, is the default way we should understand it, that she did know what she was doing. She did know he was going to die. And uh, so... Jesus favored what she did and said it will always be spoken of her whenever the gospel is preached. And we also saw in this chapter the triumphal entry, which is found in all four of the gospels. So at this point, we're having quite a bit of overlap between John's record and that of the synoptics. Two of the synoptics uh, include the anointing of Jesus at Bethany, and all three of the synoptics contain the triumphal entry, which we read about in verses 12 through 19. And at the end of verse 19, the Pharisees are talking among themselves and they're in despair 
they say you see everything we've done to try to stop this jesus movement has failed the whole world is going after him as it appeared to them of course in only a short time after this the whole world would be rejecting him with the exception of a very few faithful women and one disciple john now it says in verse 20 there were certain uh, greeks among those who came up to worship at the feast. Then they came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida of Galilee, and asked him, saying, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip came and told Andrew. And in turn, Andrew and Philip told Jesus. But Jesus answered them. It's not clear whether them is Philip and Andrew only, or whether he actually was now speaking to the Greeks who wanted to see him. He said, the hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain or much fruit. We're more familiar with the King James wording. He who loves his life will lose it. And he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, let him follow me. And where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, him my father will honor. Now, these Greeks, we don't hear about them again. We, it's interesting that John would introduce them at all when it only tells us they wanted to see Jesus. They sent a couple of the disciples to make that request for them, and we do not read whether they got the audience they desired or not. It's possible that the things Jesus said uh, that we last read were uttered to the Greeks, or maybe not. Maybe it was just uttered to Philip and Andrew. Now, Greeks, in this case, all scholars pretty much agree that this is not a reference to Greek-speaking Jews. There were such. Sometimes they are called Greeks in the book of Acts, Greek Hellenized Jews, because there were Jews who were Palestinian and spoke Aramaic the local language of Palestine, and then there were Jews who primarily spoke Greek. Now, everybody spoke Greek, at least as a second language, but there were Jews who spoke Greek as a primary language and maybe as their only language. They might not have even really known Aramaic very well. These would be Jews of the diaspora, Jews that lived out in the Roman Empire elsewhere than in Palestine, and in many cases had been Hellenized, that is, they had adopted Greek a culture, Greek dress, Greek uh, names, Greek uh, language, and so forth. And so from time to time, the Bible, especially in Acts, refers to the Hellenized Jews as Greeks. But most scholars are of the opinion that these Greeks are not Hellenized, that these are Greek men, Gentiles. Now, what are they doing at the feast then? Why are, they, why are they worshiping at the Passover feast of the Jews when they're Greeks? Uh, well, it seems obvious they were at the, the very least what we call God-fearers. And at the most, they may have been proselytes. Uh, a person who was not born Jewish and was born Gentile could attach themselves to the religion of Yahweh in one of two ways. They could become a full Jew in status by becoming circumcised, and going through whatever ritual was current in their day among the Jews to acknowledge the conversion of a Gentile to the, Yah the religion of Yahweh. And they would then be regarded as having the full privileges of Jewish people. They would hardly be Gentiles anymore then. They were more like converted to Judaism. They were Jews. But there were Gentiles who didn't go that far. They weren't sure they wanted to be Jews. They weren't sure they wanted to be circumcised, but they did think that the God of the Hebrews was a much more worthy object of worship than the Greek gods and goddesses that their own people worshipped. And these people were referred to as God-fearers. You'll find this term used in the book of Acts also. Proselytes and God-fearers were two different categories of Gentiles who, in varying degrees, attached themselves to Judaism. The proselytes were full converts and had been circumcised. The God-fearers were not circumcised and were not full converts, but they were reverent toward Yahweh. Uh, so these Greeks were at least God-fearers. 
very possibly proselytes. But the point is, in mentioning them, that John in his gospel is beginning to bring out that the mission of Jesus was going to encompass Gentiles, not just Jews. Everything up to about chapter 10 in this book has focused on Jesus' outreach to the Jews. In fact, in chapter, uh, in chapter 1 and verse 11, in summarizing Jesus' coming to the world and his mission and all of that, it says, He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. Now, the word his own in uh, the first clause is not the same word as in the second clause of this verse. In the first clause, it's, it's uh, a, re a reference to neuter things. He came to his own things or his own place or something like that, to his own planet that he had made. But then it says his own, meaning his own people. The, the word there in the Greek means his own people, meaning the Jews. He came to his own planet, and even his own people didn't receive him. But verse 12 says, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. Now, there were some who received him, and for all we know, John is referring to that remnant of Israel. He came to his own nation, his own people, the Jews, but in general, the Jews did not receive him, but some did. And to those that did, he gave them power to become sons of God. But the way it's worded, it could be that he's saying the Jews, generally speaking, did not accept him, but Gentiles, some, received him. It's hard to say, but it is a summary of the life of Jesus that the Jews to whom he first made his appeal did not, by and large, receive him. But there is hinting, as we get to the second half of this gospel, repeated hints that Gentiles are going to be receiving him, whereas the Jews are not so eager to do so. We first saw this in John chapter 10. In John chapter 10, and verse 16, Jesus in his discourse about being the good shepherd of the sheep, and that the sheep, his sheep, were the remnant of Israel, the Jewish people who were believers. He says to them in verse 16, And other sheep I have also, which are not of this fold. Them also I must bring, and they will hear my voice. And there will be one flock and one shepherd. Now, he identified his sheep, a little later in the same chapter, as those who hear his voice and follow him, in verse 27. And he says, There are people who will hear my voice and follow me, who are not Jewish, who are not of this flock, not of this fold, I'm going to go and get them too. And of course this he did through the Gentile mission, through the Apostle Paul and his companions, and has been continuing to do ever since that time. The appeal to the Gentiles, so that they become one flock and one fold with the Jewish people who are believers. So there's the mention there of the Gentile mission. Also in chapter 11, when, when Caiaphas was talking about how a Jesus must die for the people in verse 50. He said, Nor do you consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people, and not that the whole nation should perish, meaning the nation of Israel. And John tells us in verse 51, Now this he did not say on his own authority, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for that nation, that is, of course, the Jews, and not for that nation only, not only the Jews, but also that he would gather together in one the children of God who were scattered abroad. Now these have to be Gentiles because he's not only the Jews, but also the children of God scattered abroad. So Jesus and John uh, in this, uh, in chapters uh, 10 and 11, have already said that there's going to be a gathering in of Gentiles and not just Jews. And now we see these Gentiles. They don't really play a role except to be Gentiles. I mean, in the story. They don't really do anything. They just say, we want to see Jesus. 
they are coming to Jesus. They've come to Israel to worship at the feast, and they've heard about Jesus, and now they want to hear him and see him and no doubt investigate whether they should be his disciples. And while we have no more information about them, we have to almost assume that John has mentioned them here only to include them as Gentiles, showing an interest as a, somewhat of a fulfillment of these hints that were earlier made, that while the Jews are tending to reject Jesus, there are Gentiles who at this point do, and in the future will, be interested in him and follow him. Now these Greeks, they came to Philip. Uh, we do not know why they approached Philip per se, but, but we do know that his name was a Greek name. Most of the disciples had Jewish names. Philip, however, is a Greek name, as in Philip of Macedon. Uh, Philip means lover of horses in Greek. And also, uh, Andrew is a Greek name. It means manly in Greek. But most of the disciples didn't have Greek names, and it's possible that these two disciples were approached because these Greeks felt that they might have an affinity or a sympathy toward them. In all likelihood, these Greeks had Greek names too, and finding among the disciples some who had been given Greek names by their parents, suggested maybe they were Hellenists, maybe they uh, you know, were a little more approachable than most Jews were by someone who was a Greek. So they basically tell Philip, we'd like to see Jesus. And Philip doesn't know whether this is a good idea or not. The disciples were not real quick to catch on that God was interested in the Gentiles as well as the Jews. There were many hints. But remember, Peter himself, who is the leader of the group, didn't get it very quickly either. Jesus had to give him a vision three times of a sheet lowered down with unclean animals on it. And, and three times Jesus had to say, what I've cleansed, don't you call unclean? Which was a cryptic reference to Gentiles. And this was to prepare Peter for the shocking fact that Peter was going to go into a Gentile's house and preach and baptize Gentiles who were uncircumcised. Doesn't seem very radical to you and me because we are either Gentiles ourselves or our Jewish brother here has lived in America long enough and it's not surprising for Gentiles to be Christians. But at that time, Gentiles were, had never been Christians and they had not been Jews unless they were proselytes. They were uncircumcised and therefore it had to be decided whether an uncircumcised man could be a Christian. And this was years after Pentecost. And Peter was slow in getting it. And the other disciples criticized him when they found out he had baptized and eaten with these Gentiles when he went back to Jerusalem. In Acts chapter 11, it says the other apostles took him to task and said, you went into the house of Gentiles and ate with them. And so he had to tell the story. And then reluctantly, the apostles said, oh, well, okay, then I guess God has granted repentance to the Gentiles as well. So they officially accepted the idea that Gentiles could be Christians. That is a long time after Pentecost. This point in time we're reading about is a long time, uh, at least the, di the disciples are a long distance short of Pentecost. And they're not sure, apparently, whether Jesus would be interested in seeing a Greek or not. Many rabbis would not entertain a Greek, uh, especially if he's uncircumcised. Most rabbis would not. And so these Greeks are probably dressed like Greeks. They probably have come from Greece or from that region. And so it's obvious to Philip that these men are Greeks. And so he's not, he doesn't go alone to Jesus, not sure what Jesus' reaction will be. He gets Andrew, who again had a Greek name and may have been a Hellenist. Uh, and the two of them together go to Jesus. Now, Jesus answers either these two disciples privately or else the Greeks. And he does not say whether he will see the Greeks or not. But he may be saying these Greeks may be looking for something that they'll be disappointed about because I'm about ready to be crucified. They may be looking for a, a powerful king, uh, a messianic deliverer. Uh, they may be looking for somebody like Alexander the Great to become the king of the Jews. And uh, since these Greeks are interested in the Jewish religion, maybe they're seeing whether the Messiah is here and whether he'll be the one that will, will uh, 
you know, do radical acts of deliverance for his people. And Jesus says, well, actually, the time has come for me to be glorified. But glorified to Jesus means crucified. The crucifixion was the first step toward his glorification. It was the first step in a, a process of God restoring him to the glory that he had before. He's to be crucified, buried, and then launched back into heaven. And so this glorification process is, in a sense, before he could go back up, he had to go further down. He that ascended, what is it but that he first descended to the lower parts of the earth, that he might fill all things, Paul said in Ephesians 4. Uh, before he could ascend, he had to descend. It may be like uh, you could imagine shooting an arrow up. You have to pull it down first before it would be launched up. And Jesus had to go down into Hades as the first step toward going back up into the presence of his Father. Now, these Greeks might not be pleased with this. They, he may not be what they're looking for. I don't know if that's why Jesus is saying this or if he's just ignoring the Greeks and ignoring even the disciples request he just Jesus tends to say what he wants to say no matter what the setting is a lot of times he kind of ignores what he's asked but there must be some reason that he said it on this occasion when there's mention of the Greeks it's hard really to know for sure what the reason is and how what he says is connected to those men since we know very little about those men we only know they're Greeks who wanted to see Jesus their motives their state of mind we don't know much about but Jesus said, the hour has come. Now, many times in the Gospel of John before this, it said his hour had not yet come. Many took up stones and stone, but his hour had not yet come. Many sought to take him, but his hour had not yet come. He said to his mother, my hour has not yet come. He said to his brothers, my hour is not yet, but yours is always now. Jesus has always talked about how it's not yet time. He's not on his own schedule. There's a, a set time that his father has set, and it had not until now been the time, but this is the time. He says, my hour has come. The hour has come in which the Son of Man should be glorified. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. Before a seed will shoot up above the ground, it has to go below the ground. As I was saying, the first step up is down. Before he can ascend... He has to descend. And so he says, I am going to, in fact, produce much fruit. But like a seed, I have to be buried first. I have to go down first. I have to die first. Like a seed has to germinate in order to become a plant. Now, why would, why would anyone bury a seed? Because they want to produce more of the same. More grain. Much grain. And a seed is an amazing thing in that respect. A seed is an individual unit but when it grows into a plant it produces many of the same seeds it duplicates itself and that's what Jesus was going to do he's going to duplicate himself in his people he's going to reproduce himself in many people that that seed is an individual unit the stock that grows from it is an individual unit too it's a one plant it's one plant that has many seeds upon it but those seeds are duplicates of the original seed, but they're all connected. They're all still part of one organism. Just as Jesus himself was the whole body of Christ, but when he went to heaven, he poured out his spirit, and we became the other parts of the body of Christ. It's still one organism. Jesus is still the head, and we are to be made like him. In Mark chapter 4, Jesus told a parable that's found only in Mark's gospel. And it's a little bit like other parables, but it's got features of its own. And he said in Mark 4, verse 26 through 29, Jesus said, The kingdom of God is as if a man should scatter seed on the ground and should sleep by night and rise by day, and the seed should sprout and grow. He himself does not know how, for the earth yields crops by itself. Okay, so this is the first part of the, the first lesson of the parable is that the kingdom of God uh, people spread the seeds, but they don't know how it grows. It's, it's God that makes it grow. People can go to bed and it'll still grow, even when they're not tending it. That's what Paul said when he was writing to the Corinthians about how they were hit God's field. In 1 Corinthians 3, he says, 
I planted, and Apollos watered, but what? God gave the increase. God made it grow. I can't make it grow. I can put the seed in the ground. We can water the seed, but we can't make it grow. Only God can give it increase. And that's what this parable is saying, too. Paul obviously got the message from this parable, or just from the Holy Spirit, that he can plant the seed, but he might as well go to bed. It'll grow as much while he's there as when he's not there. God's the one who makes it come to life. And so he says, the kingdom of God is like that. Men throw seeds on the ground, and they grow in ways that the people don't even know because it's God's work. It's like the earth itself seems to produce the, the plant. But then he says in verse 28, when he describes the crops coming up, he says, first the blade, then the head, or the ear, like an ear of corn, a head of grain. After that, the full grain, or the mature grain in the head, the ripened grain in the head. But when the grain ripens, immediately he puts in the sickle because the harvest has come. Now the harvest in the parables appears to be the second coming. At least it is in some of the other cases. In the, in the wheat and the tares and in the, uh, well, especially the wheat and the tares. And that's, that's where the harvest appears to be, the second coming of Christ, when he sends forth his angels to gather all things that offend out of, out of his kingdom and cast them into a furnace of fire. So the end, the culmination, is the harvest. But Jesus says the harvest will come when the grain is ripe, when the, the grain in the head is full, is mature. And he's telling us something about God's project. The seeds began to be planted in the days of the apostles. They still are planted, and there's still growth. But the growth is incremental. The seed, when it first sprouts, just looks like a little blade of grass. It's just a little blade. It's not anything you could eat. Cattle could eat it, but people wouldn't eat it. It just looks like grass. It's just a blade. But then, as it gets taller, appear on it heads of grain. But there's nothing edible in them. The head is there long before there's any ripe grain or full mature grain in it. And once the head is formed, then within the head, grain appears and eventually ripens or matures. And he says, now when the grain in the head is mature, that's when the harvest comes. How are we to understand that? Well, obviously, he's the seed, or the word is the seed, and he is the word. And as that is sown, life begins. The kingdom begins small, like a blade of grass, but it soon has heads attached to the stalk. What is a head of grain? It's a collection or a cluster of seed, very much like the original seed. Originally, they're not very mature, but they are there. And they're in a cluster. They're gathered in groups called head. And within the head, Jesus says, the grain ripens. I don't know if I'd be reading too much into this to say that the stock that he describes is the kingdom of God, the global kingdom of God, the global church. The heads are like individual gatherings or fellowships, local, local assemblies. <laughs> the church in a given town or in another town. Clusters of grains. The original seed is reproducing itself, multiplying itself, and this multiplication takes place in the context of a head or an ear of grain. And the individual grains have to mature. The body of Christ has to mature. Paul said, until we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a mature man, to the measure of the fullness of the stature of Christ. So that this is what God is waiting for, for Christ to be fully reproduced in each grain, in each head. Now, I don't know what that looks like, but I know in principle what that sounds like. It sounds like he's saying that the body of Christ is comprised of local churches in various locations around the world. Each of these is itself a cluster of living or potentially life-giving grain. People, people like Jesus. Jesus was like a seed planted in the ground. And his being planted resulted in a plant growing, the body of Christ, the kingdom, the church. 
And the ultimate goal before the harvest comes will be the maturing of the individuals in the body of Christ until we all come to a mature man. In the same passage, which is Ephesians 4, Paul says that we be no longer children tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine and cunning craftiness and sleight of men by which they deceive. But he said that, that we might mature and grow up into him in all things. We grow up or mature into the likeness of Christ. So, Jesus says, he is like a grain of wheat. Ultimately, he's going to produce many grains, much grain. He's going to produce many like himself. He's going to reproduce his life in many others. And this will require that he first be buried. It requires that he first die. And if he would refuse to die, he will remain alone. There will only be one like him. And that will be himself. He'll be, he'll be simply unique and he'll be the only son of God that the world has ever seen. But if he dies, then there will be many sons of God. Many grains like him. Not of the same status, of course. Just be, I mean, like we're, we are members of his body, but we're not the head. He's the head. He's, the head is a member of the body. So is the hand and so is the foot. But the head is the most prominent. The head is a unique member, but it's still part of the organism. And so we are part of the organism. And we are like Christ. And we are becoming like Christ. We're maturing, as Paul said, we with open face beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are changed from glory to glory into that same image, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. That's 2 Corinthians 3.18, in case you wanted that. Paul, writing to the Galatians in Galatians 4.19, he was grieved that they were drifting from the Gospels, and he was remembering the travail he had gone through in evangelizing them initially. And he said, my little children, with whom I travail again in birth until Christ is formed in you. The goal Paul had for the Christians was that Christ would be formed in them. Peter, in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 19, is talking about how we are living in a dark place in which the word of God provides the best light we have. He speaks of the scriptures, and he says, To which you do well to give heed, as unto a light that shines in a dark place, until the day dawns and the day star arises in your hearts. Well, who's the day star? Christ is the morning star. So he's to arise in our hearts. What's that mean? There's got to be a dawning of the glory of God arising upon us. So Paul says, when Christ, who is our life, shall appear, we shall appear with him in glory. In Romans 8, he says, the, the sufferings of the present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory that shall be revealed in us. Or in 1 Corinthians 4, somewhere around verse 17 or 18, Paul says, our light afflictions, which are but for a moment, work for us a far more eternal weight of glory. Our afflictions work for us a weight of glory, and it's going to, this glory is going to be revealed in us, Paul says in Romans 8, 18. So <clears throat> there's many references to what God is trying to do in us. He's trying to duplicate Christ, the glory of God that was in Christ in us. Remember John began his gospel saying in chapter 1 and verse 14, the word became flesh and we beheld his glory. And then it says, it was the glory as of the only begotten son of a father, full of grace and truth. And two verses later he says, and of his fullness we have all received, even grace upon grace. Jesus was full of grace and truth. And we have all received that fullness ourselves, to be full of grace and truth, to be like him. And so this is what God has in mind. And Jesus then says, if he does not die, he'll be the only one like him. But if a grain gives up its own life, it rises again and produces more like itself and produces much grain. 
And Jesus is clearly talking about himself. But he's giving a principle that applies to others as well, including his disciples. So that he tells them that they themselves, like him, will probably have to die in order to be fruitful. We could say at least die to yourself. Because he says in the next verse, he who loves his life will lose it. And he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Now, here he's not talking about himself, though he certainly must have been when he talked about the grain falling in the ground, but now he's applying it to others. If you love your life in this world, you certainly will not fall into the ground and die voluntarily. Because you love your life as it is. You preserving your life is your chief priority. It's the strongest human instinct is self-preservation. But when you are born again and you have the divine nature, you have new instincts. You still have old ones too, but the new ones are capable of uh, overwhelming the old ones. So that Christians can say, well, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. I'm not afraid to die anymore. Self-preservation is not my highest priority. I don't love my life in this world supremely as, as a, a natural man does. I'm willing to die. He says, but if anyone uh, hates his life in this world, he'll keep it for eternal life. Now, when he says hates his life, it doesn't really mean that you have to re you're expected to despise and, and have uh, utter hatred for yourself or for your life, but rather it's a, it's a manner of speaking. It's like when Jesus said in Luke 14, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and his mother and his wife and his children and his own life also, he can't be my disciple. He's certainly talking, uh, using the idiomatic Hebraic use of the word hate, which means to prefer less than something else. Hate is a much stronger word in our language. But in their language, it, was mean, it, it often meant to just to not prefer something. Jacob I have loved, Esau I have hated. Just means I have preferred Jacob over Esau. 